Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Today, we're talking with Dr. Stephanie Melka. Melka, welcome to Healthful Woman. Hi, thank you for having me. Melka, as we refer to you and not and us. I mean, why, why is it? How come you're not Stephanie? I don't know. It started in high school on the track team somewhere. People went by last names. And then I got to college and someone called me Stephanie and I didn't answer because I didn't register that they were talking to me and became Melka and it sort of stuck ever since. So we're here with Melka. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Is this your first podcasting experience? It is. Wonderful. Other than listening to podcasts. Very nice. Melka is an OBGYN who works at Maternal Fetal Medicine Associates. Melka, tell me, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? Born and raised in Staten Island, New York. What brought you to go into career in medicine in the first place? I don't really know. Growing up, I sort of always wanted to be a doctor. I like the thought of being a veterinarian for about two weeks. And then I realized I'd have to put animals to sleep, decided that wasn't for me. And then it was sort of medicine ever since. Okay. So the, the humans are your second choice. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then when you're in medical school and you're trying to decide on a field to go into, what brought you to obstetrics and gynecology? So my first rotation clinically was trauma surgery at Kings County Hospital. And it was a lot of time in the operating room. And I really liked surgery. I really liked doing things. And then as I rotated through, I realized I gravitated more towards surgical fields. But I also liked the fields where there was more continuity of care. And then I got to the OB rotation and it sort of had everything. You know, you do surgeries, do procedures, you take care of patients, and then you sort of develop more longstanding relationships with them. And then you started your residency, your internship at Mount Sinai in New York. What what year did you start? The same year and day that you did, July 2008. So that was my return to Mount Sinai. Correct. Because I did my medical school and residency there. And then when I came back as uh, attending, you were an intern. That's that's when our paths first crossed. Yes. And so we met and I was either responsible for all of the good things you did or all the bad things you did. And uh, A little of column A, a little of column B. <laughs> and then four years later, here we are. You join you join us and we've been working together ever since. The reason I wanted to work with Melka is because she's a big runner. So when did you get into running? Also in high school. I kind of wanted to be on a sport. I couldn't throw, hit, catch, or kick. So I tried running and really liked it. Oh, so you ran track in high school I ran or distance? Or? Cross country, track and field in high school. And I got to college and did the same and really liked doing the longer distances. By 2008, you had done a marathon? Yes. My first in 2006, I was in med school at Downstate and my friends, Kristen, Megan and I were doing the nine New York Roadrunner qualifying races. This was so long ago, it wasn't nine plus one. It was just nine. And while we were doing the qualifying races, I was thinking, you know, I don't want to wait until next year to do a marathon. I want to do one now. So I picked Philly and Philly 2006 was my first. It must be pretty hard to train for a marathon in medical school. By that point in my life, you know, having gone through cross country and track for eight years, running was part of my day to day life. You know, I would go to class, I would get home and it was sort of the way I would decompress before studying. I first started running in medical school also, but I'd never really run before that. My father was and is a big runner. And so it was like in my life, but I never really tried it until medical school. But the first time I decided to do a marathon was 2011. So the 2011 New York City Marathon, I was training and I did it. And the New York City Marathon course, for our listeners who don't know that, crosses right in front of Mount Sinai Hospital on Fifth Avenue. And in fact, when, they, when the runners go by Fifth Avenue between 98th and 99th Street, the labor floor overlooks that street on the second floor. And so every year on Marathon Sunday, you know, everyone on the labor floor will look at the runners go by and whatnot. And in 2011, when I'm doing the marathon and I'm coming, I guess, down Fifth Avenue, it's not a good time for first time runners. You have about four miles left, five miles left, you've hit quote unquote the wall. And I was really struggling. It was not a good time. Uh, I was probably hallucinating. It was not pleasant. And then 
I jumped in with you. I had my, and my runner friends will know this, I had my fuel belt, I had my two air horns, I had gel, I had salt packets, I had shot blocks, and I jumped in with you and I said, I've got all these things, what do you need? And you said, run me up to the park because my family's there. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Ran you up the right, hill. The, the entire seven blocks. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> oh, no. It was about a mile. I jumped yeah. in with you in Harlem. Yeah. Oh, boy. I see. I don't even remember. Yeah. I was definitely hypoxic at that time. Yeah. And so Melka ran with me, uh, sort of like the top gun. Yes. She was my wingman. She she brought me home. I flew you in. She I calmed you down. In. I flew you in. And uh, that was an act of kindness. I uh, did not forget and will never forget. Got me to the park, saw my family, which gave me another second wind, and then was able to finish. And then actually we did that again in 2013. We ran together. I wasn't struggling quite as much, but then you hopped out again. We were already working together at that time. And then Melka had a point where she was running consecutive marathons. Yeah, I mentioned Philly in 06. My second one was New York in 2007, the one that we did the qualifier for. And in February of 07, my very good friend from high school, John, got diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma. He's doing well now. He's fine. But I got involved with Team and Training, an organization to run endurance events and raise money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And then that sort of got me in with a great group of people who are a lot of them still very good friends of mine to this day. And I think at this point, I've done 11 marathons and one triathlon. It's amazing. Now, does your marathoning or your running, does that come in at all to how you talk to patients about exercise, either in life or in pregnancy? Is that something you bring in? Is that something you keep separate? So my marathon coaching actually helps me with coaching patients in labor. And anyone out there that I've pushed with for two to three hours will often say, like, you're so motivating. Like, how did you get my mind off of it? And I've said, well, I'm used to jumping in with people at mile 22 of the marathon and getting them through to the end. So it definitely comes in in terms of the the motivational aspect. How yeah. about just the sort of like the healthy lifestyle aspect? Yeah. I know that there's, me- there's medals in your office and it's definitely, it's <laughs> it's... People see, you know, a lot of us do that. I have the same thing. People see that you run when they walk in. It must be a conversation piece for a lot of patients. Definitely. And I think patients appreciate having a doctor who is active and is able to give them realistic advice. As you know, I have an almost two-year-old, so I was pregnant not that long ago and was very fatigued. I wasn't exercising that much. So, you know, it's helpful that I could relate to patients and explain to them sort of how to listen to your body, how to make compromises in terms of your activity and give people actual real suggestions of what to do. Going to that, so when you're pregnant, and you're an obstetrician yourself, yes. and you're seeing patients <laughs> who are pregnant, who are, you know, the same stage as you, they're earlier, they're later, they've maybe they've had uh, an easier pregnancy or harder pregnancy. What What's that like? It gave me more sympathy in some regards and less sympathy in others. Acid reflux is a common thing in pregnancy, and I never really got it until I had it. And I was like, oh my God, this is miserable. Now I understand. Having gone through it, I think even, you know, having been an OB for so long gave me a really different perspective on what it is that people go through. Was it something that you would voluntarily speak about with patients you weren't experienced or they would just ask you about it themselves? I assume some patients sort of like didn't know what to do in that situation also. A little of both. Yeah. Some people even now ask what it was like for me if I have kids. Other people didn't really want to hear anything about it. It's interesting. And obviously I've never been pregnant, but I do have kids. And particularly when I was younger and starting, and many of the people I was seeing were older than me, for a lot of them, it gave them some sort of comfort knowing that I had kids myself. I've been in this situation. I sort of know what to expect. And and for other people, it just didn't really seem to make a big difference. It's interesting how people connect to that. I mean, I mentioned the reflux thing earlier, but I found now when I tell patients, you know, yeah, I hear you. I was miserable too. This is what I took. I understand why you're trying to avoid it. But once I did this, it made it better. I think it kind of puts things in a different perspective for people. And then also recently you've gotten very active and involved in nursing. Yes. Breastfeeding medicine. Yeah. So we're definitely going to have a a podcast about that in general, but just how did you get into explain what you've, what you've done and sort of what your, you know, extra 
training has been and sort of where you see this in the future? Last year, I did a four-day course in Chicago in breastfeeding medicine. And what I'm trying to do now is more of the medical aspect of it. Living in New York City, we have a ton of resources out there in terms of lactation consultants, doulas, people that can go to your house and do day-to-day stuff. But what I'm focusing on, I think, is more of the patients who are at risk for breastfeeding failures, which is a lot of our patients, you know, patients who are diabetic, who have preterm babies, who have twins, and kind of learning more about the different problems that they face. And so helping to support them and maybe they can come see you either beforehand or if they're having issues or whatnot. Yes. It's actually unusual for physicians to be involved in in breastfeeding processes. So certainly if there's, let's say, a complication from it, so women would come back with, you know, maybe an infection or whatever, we treat them. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of us just sort of, once she delivers and she leaves the hospital, we don't see her for six weeks. You're on your own. Yeah. But it all works out. I think my education and residency was two one-hour lectures over four years about breastfeeding. And I didn't learn much. And then when I joined the practice and I was getting some of the phone calls, I learned a little bit more. But now having gone through it, it's amazing how much you learn just by breastfeeding a child, by going back to work, by pumping. You and I had meetings while I was pumping at work and I would pump in front of you and it was fine. But I can understand why there are women out there who don't feel comfortable doing that. And why there are, you know, people who ha- work in a place where that isn't possible. It's a real challenge because every situation is unique. You know, you can have a sweeping rule that says everything is, you know, acceptable and fine, which is great. But a lot of women, despite even, let's say, the idea that it's okay, there's just also logistical things that have to get worked out with that. On the labor floor, we have many OBGYNs who are, you know, new moms or they're nursing or whatever it is. And Everyone there obviously supports it and is, you know, in favor of it. But logistically, where is it going to be done? What are you going to do with the milk? What are you going to do if you have to see a patient in the middle? And there's a lot of stuff that comes in. And that's just one particular space. And there's so many different possibilities of what challenges might lie ahead. Definitely. So that's something that's great that you're doing that. And we're definitely going to have a separate podcast about breastfeeding. I look forward to it. (laughs) It'll be amazing. (laughs) Excellent. And so currently you see patients at Maternal Field Medicine Associates, the 90th Street office, and you do a lot of deliveries at Mount Sinai Hospital. And if anyone wants to see Dr. Melka or Melka, uh, obviously (laughs) call the office and make an appointment. And otherwise, Melka, thanks for coming on. This was fantastic. This was great. Thank you. All right. We will see you in many future podcasts. I'm sure that. Bring it. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.